Where does yesterday's future, which is already here, ready here, ready here, ready here, meet today's future, which is about to happen, and tomorrow's future, which could be just minutes away? Welcome to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Where host Bonnie D. Graham asks savvy futurists for their predictions about the tech driven trends that are shaping our future right now. Here's your host who will take us into the future of now, Bonnie D. Graham. <laughs> the future of now, now, now. Bonnie in the house. That's the voice of my co producer, Ryan Treasure, the VP, I say, of everything at Voice America Radio. I always get a laugh and goosebumps when he reads that intro. Today, we have an interesting topic. It was not picked specifically for this pandemic environment we're in around the world, but it's very applicable. So let me start off with the buzz. The buzz on the street is several headlines I found and a little bit of copy from these headlines and this will set us up. Then I'll have my panelists introduce themselves. This show is very important for all of you. So found an article in the New York Times December 2018 and the headline was your apps know where you were last night and they're not keeping it secret. Let me read a little bit from the article. This is remember 2018. Dozens of companies use smartphone locations to help advertisers and even hedge funds. They say it's anonymous, but the data shows how personal it is. Millions of dots on the map trace highways, side streets, and bike trails following the path of an anonymous cell phone user. However, one path tracks a person from a home outside Newark, New Jersey to a nearby Planned Parenthood, remaining there for more than an hour. Another set of dots, another path, represents a person who travels with the mayor of New York during the day and returns to their home at Long Island at night. Let's fast forward 16 months later to April 3rd, 2020. That's just about a week ago. Listen up. Google is publicly releasing the data it's already collecting about people's movements during the corona pandemic. To show the types of places people are visiting across 131 countries and regions, it hopes tracking movement trends over time and by geography could help shape and inform governments and public health, health officials' response to the corona virus pandemic. And one more headline, same day, April 3rd, Can Our Phones Stop a Pandemic? On Friday that week, Apple and Google said they were building software into smartphones that could tell people if they were in recent contract contact with someone who was infected with the virus. Some countries are using smartphone location data and other personal information to track coronavirus outbreaks or make sure people are staying home. I'm getting goosebumps. I don't know if you are. I have three panelists on the show today. They're all experts in some way related to location data and tracking. And is it really anonymous? I don't think so. And we're going to hear from them in a moment. I'm so happy to welcome back a lady who was on another show with me recently, Heather Fetterman at Big ID. And she has invited the other two panelists to join us, Joe Jerome at Common Sense Media and Kanisa Ahmed at Aliada. We'll find out if I pronounce that right. So join me for the next whatever's left of this hour, 43, 53 minutes. Uh, and the topic today is everyone knows where you were last night and right now, the future of location data. I'm Bonnie D. Graham. Happy to be here. Heather Fetterman, you're up first. Heather, hope everything is well. Hope you are isolating successfully in place. And Heather, in case somebody doesn't know who you are, I know you're the VP of Privacy and Policy at Big ID. Heather, please introduce yourself to the audience and tell us why this topic is important to you. Sure, and thank you for having me back again, Bonnie. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, I, as you said, I'm at Big ID, where I manage and lead initiatives related to privacy evangelism, product innovation, internal compliance, and industry collaboration. Prior to Big ID, I was the Director of Privacy and Data Risk at Macy's, and before that, the Senior Privacy Manager at American Express. I'm a lawyer by training, and I started my career at the Future of Privacy Forum as a legal and policy fellow, and that's actually how I know the other two panelists, Joe and Kanisa. We were also all fellows together. And the topic today, location data, the, the three of us, us panelists, we were aware of how sensitive location information is. It's, it's by various legal regimes considered to be a highly sensitive data element, and now that we're using it to help potentially stop a pandemic, it becomes even more important how we're collecting this, how we're using it, how long we're attaining it. So figuring out these 
what this is, how it works, and what we're going to do with it, it's more important now than ever. Thank you, Heather. And you were the one who suggested the topic a couple of weeks ago. Did you have in mind that we would actually be putting this through the lens, if you will, of COVID-19? Or were you just thinking, hey, Bonnie, that's a cool topic. Let's talk about location data. What was on your mind? Because you sent me the New York Times article from 2018, and I found the ones from April 3rd, obviously. So were you thinking, wow, this is a hot topic? Or Yeah, it's just interesting. I think both. I think this has been a hot topic for a while, but it's becoming even more of a, let's say the topic is now on fire because it's such a pressing issue. It's location information and our sensitive health information. These are the two types of data that are going to be in the news that we really care about today. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate it very much. I love when a topic gets sizzling as we get closer to the show date. Let's move around the table and let's find out who Joe Jerome is in Common Sense Media. Welcome, Joe. You and I have never met. Happy to have you here. Any, any guest of Heather's, any, any invitee from her is a, is a special person on my show. So Joe Jerome, tell us, what do you do? What is Common Sense Media and what's your passion for this topic or your POV? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to join too this morning. Uh, so, I currently work as the multi-state policy director at Common Sense Media, and uh, Common Sense Media, I think most folks know us through, um, parents certainly know us because we do lots of ratings and reviews of, of movies um, and, and video games and education technologies. Uh, so we really sort of serve as a resource um, for parents uh, to sort of navigate the the really sort of turbulent digital waters of you know raising um, children in our in our digital universe. Um, our, I'm on our policy team, and you know our priorities historically have included things like privacy, digital well-being, making tech companies and, and platforms more responsible for some of the the more problematic issues that we've seen come out of the the I, I like to say the digital Pandora's box. Mm-hmm. Um, Right now, during this crisis, you know, our focus has been on online connectivity, you know, addressing things like the digital divide, where all of us are frankly stuck at home and completely reliant on the Internet to, to do our jobs, or in the case of kids, you know, get an education. Uh, a month ago, ironically, my job was very different. It was all privacy all the time. Um, mm-hmm. I was traveling uh, to <laughs> to some of these hotspots like San Francisco and Olympia, Washington, um, talking to to lawmakers about privacy legislation, um, and putting safeguards around geolocation data was, you know, in that you know distant past, top of mind. Uh, I know it seems like a lifetime ago, mm-hmm. uh, but you, you know, you highlighted that the New York Times ended 2019 with a giant expose about some of the unintended consequences of what happens when location data is accessed and shared. And, and that follows up a, a really good um, story that the New York Times did in 2018 about this. Geolocation information is, inc- is it's fascinating because it reveals, you know, where we work, where we pray, and, you know, where we play. And now I think we're confronted with location data being held out as this potential great solution to fight back against the, the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the, the, on the show we'll discuss that the, the jury's out on that. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do think information, geolocation information is really where some of the biggest privacy and surveillance debates are happening today. And as Heather mentioned, you know, we all met at the Future of Privacy Forum. And after that, I, my career took me into private practice in a, in, a, in a privacy and security practice at a law firm and uh, at the Privacy Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And at all of those spots, um, geolocation information was always something we sort of felt like we needed to it was a top of mind concern to clients and something that, you know, we really need to have firmer rules for. Thank you, Joe. Pleasure to meet you. I'm very impressed with your background, and we're going to learn a lot from you after we finish with the this round of introductions. We're going to go to your quotes. You all sent me your future focus quotes. Now let's meet Kenisa Ahmed. Kenisa, pleasure to have you on as well. Friend of Heather is a friend of my show. Kenisa, please enlighten us. What do you do? What's your passion for this topic? Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm currently co-founder and partner at Alita. Um, Bonnie, very close. <laughs> um, everyone pronounces that. We we we, uh, we have a multiple uh, identities when it comes to our name. Um, hmm. We're a boutique privacy and security consulting firm based in San Francisco. Um, so we're a team of lawyers, technologists, and business people who understand and break down privacy. 
Uh, so businesses can focus on, on what they need to do to be successful. Um, prior to Alita, I was a consultant at the Promontory Financial Group, uh, now IBM. Um, and I got my start in privacy, of course, many years ago at the Future Privacy Forum, along with Heather and Joe. Um, I'm also a co-founder and board member of Women in Security and Privacy with, and that's a nonprofit organization uh, that we started several years ago that aims to advance women in the converging fields of privacy and security. Um, we have a group in San Francisco, New York, D.C., and Dublin, Ireland. Um, and I'm also a lawyer by training, but my focus these days is helping companies, organizations really understand how to integrate privacy into emerging technologies. And I'm just really excited to be on this show today. It's a critical time to be thinking through these issues. There are no easy solutions. And, you know, Heather, Joe, and I, and many of our peers have been thinking about uh, discussing these issues for years, and they're only becoming more complex. So uh, really excited to be speaking again with you all this morning. Thank you so much, Kanisa. Interesting, the, the convergence of technology, privacy, security, and the good of all, the health of the world. I think that's something that we hadn't thought about, at least I hadn't, in terms of, yeah, do I want anybody to know where I am? Well, like I read in the in the opening in that New York Times article, Heather, that you sent me, uh, the, the dots on the map are tracking how long somebody stayed at Planned Parenthood, and we're not going to get into that. But the point is, maybe now it can help. In that third article, can your cell phones, can our phones stop? a pandemic. So it's taken on a new meaning and the qu- meaning and the question is, is there a greater good in giving up that privacy slash is our security at risk? Big, big topic. Thank you all for your bios. I am extremely impressed with your backgrounds. Now's the time of the show where each of my speakers Special panelists have sent me a quote about the future, and we're going to keep this really brief so we can get to the prediction soon. Heather Fetterman sent me a quote from Marshall McLuhan, Canadian philosopher, lived from 1911 to 1980. His work is one of the cornerstones of the study of media theory. He coined the term, if anybody on the show is old enough to remember this, the medium is the message. He also coined the term global village, but maybe most important, Marshall McLuhan predicted the World Wide Web almost 30 years before it was invented. And Heather, I don't know if you know this, but he made, he had six children and he had a lot of bills to pay. So he took speaking engagements from large corporations, including IBM and AT&T, but he had a cameo appearance in the Woody Allen movie Annie Hall in 1977 when a pompous academic was arguing with Woody Allen in a cinema queue, a line, and he's silenced by McLuhan, who appeared as himself and said, you know nothing of my work. And that became one of McLuhan's most frequent statements to and about those who disagreed with him for the rest of his life. I thought that was interesting. Here's the quote Heather has picked. We shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. Heather, take about two minutes to tell us what this has to do with our topic, please. Sure. And and as you said, Bonnie, McLuhan is a, a very smart guy. And, and I think about the tools that we create, and specifically in the context of location, our, our smartphones. So our, we're mainly tracked through our smartphones with location. And the past decade, and even now the next year, as, as we try to figure out this pandemic, we, we are in the process of shaping how we're going to be using location to track to hopefully contain the spread of this virus. But the concern is that once we, as we do the shaping, are the, is the way that we shape these tools, these location tracking tools, are they going to be here to stick, stick around for the long term? And it's the permanency which really concerns me. Thank you. Me yep. This quote is that, yep. I thought you stopped. Go ahead. Finish your sentence, please. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, so that was um, so that's basically what attracted me to, to the quote is that the, the idea that we're in the process right now of really shaping what this is going to look like, and it will likely have long term effects that even the makers of these tools of these containment efforts might not even realize years, decades from now. Thank you very much, Heather. Love the quote. Had not heard that one before. Joe Jerome has picked a quote from Ivan E. Sutherland from an article called The Ultimate Display. Sutherland is very much alive and well, born in 1938. 
I don't exactly call him a young guy, but he's still around and <laughs> still around. We're glad. He's an American computer scientist and internet pioneer regarded as the father of computer graphics, which I thought was amazing. Wired wrote an article called Augmented Reality, the Ultimate Display by Ivan Sutherland, 1965, and said it was a seed bomb of emergent technologies. Very interesting. Uh, let's read the quote. It's a long one. And Joe, take about two minutes also to explain this. So here's the quote. The ultimate display would, of course, be a room within which the computer can control the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining. And a bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. With appropriate programming, such a display could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. Joe, I got chills reading this. What is this all about? How does this relate to our topic? Wow. Go ahead. So it's, it's, it's a bit circuitous, but it definitely does relate to the topic at hand. So being that we're all, or certainly I'm trapped at home, I've been doing some research and thinking into a virtual reality. And this is a technology, as this quote um, identifies, that was envisioned over 50 years ago. And, uh, you know, the, and now we're at a time when the sorts of artificial yet immersive visual audio and, and tactile experiences that Sutherland was dreaming up in 1965 um, can now be, you know, purchased off on Amazon. Um, you know, <laughs> a, a virtual digital escape, I think, at least to me, sounds great right now. But, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, and you know, mixed reality, these a, a VR, AR buzzwords, they are, they are fueled by an explosion in data collection and processing. Um, this entails eye tracking information. Sensor data for microphones, motion and depth sensors, um, inward, outward-facing cameras uh, that, you know, will record audio and measure movement and then gas- gather information about, our, um, you know, our surrounding rooms and environments. This entails all sorts of really granular, precise geolocation data. And this is something that users aren't going to be able to really control. Um, that location information is going to be needed for these these headsets and these really awesome 5G-enabled AR eyeglasses, you know, buzzwords galore, to actually function. And when you think about it, a universe where we're going to have real-world, real-time annotations of everything as we're walking around the street, um, that that involves a whole lot of really interesting and really sensitive location information that is permanent. And I I guess, uh, you know, I think this technology is incredibly compelling, all sorts of awesome use cases. Uh, if you if you talk to industry folks, you know I think they think it could be like the next mobile computing platform. Um, but I, I, you know I guess I'm just looking forward to a future um, where I'm not chained to my phone all day, you know, looking down at it. And and I really think virtual reality and the type of data collection that's going to be required to to actually make this meet its full potential is fascinating. It is fascinating. Joe, thank you for that. I have never heard of Ivan Sutherland and never read the quote before, and I appreciate it. Let's go to Kanisa Ahmed, and Kanisa sent us a quote from one of the movies we hear a lot of quotes from. Uh, This is Robert Zemeckis' 1985 sci-fi hit comedy film, Back to the Future. And in this quote, Doc Brown says to Marty McFly in the closing of the film, quote, where we're going, we won't need roads. Kanisa, take about two minutes and tell me how this relates to our topic today, please. Well, other than um, that movie just being a family favorite movie, I know backwards and forwards, having watched that that VHS tape a million times growing up, I think that line is an apt description for where we're heading with respect to location data um, in that the constructs that we're so used to will not only be soon outdated and outmoded, but surpassed by technological advancements that are hard to anticipate. And some of those technologies are already here just to go off of the uh, the road analogy, like drone use. I, I read just recently about the University of uh, South Australia, who in partnership with um, a tech company is developing a drone to detect people in crowds with respiratory conditions in response to COVID-19 uh, technology being developed. So um, you know, a positive spin on this is that there's an opportunity here to tear everything down and build systems that are privacy protective not biased if we're willing to make certain sacrifices. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your great quotes. I want to take a moment here and welcome our brand new sponsor to the show. It's Plume, 
P-L-U-M-E. Let me tell you about them. Plume is a cloud-based software company specializing in a suite of smart home services. It's more than just an evolution of what you may know as mesh Wi-Fi. Plume offers hardware that they call pods, that's right, P-O-D-S, that provide Wi-Fi coverage throughout your house if you need it. Plume gives you great Wi-Fi and network security seamlessly integrated with your existing network. Now, let me share a personal note here from my co-producer, Ryan Treasure at Voice America. He uses Plume to increase the streaming speed in his house. It's faster now for Netflix and online video games because Plume's advanced self-optimization of adaptive Wi-Fi makes sure the areas in Ryan's home that use more internet are given more bandwidth. That just makes sense. No more buffering and no more spinning wheels of death. We all hate that. And Ryan, maybe even more importantly, uses Plume's parental controls to monitor his very smart six-year-old's internet usage. He can customize the rules for her devices. Yes, she has devices to control when she can get on the internet, the kinds of content she can and cannot access. Mm -hmm. And he could even schedule an internet freeze or timeout for school nights and family time. Plume's suite of services include blazing, fast, flawless Wi-Fi, advanced cybersecurity for devices and your whole network, personalized content, and personal parental access controls and all new motion detection. How easy it is for you to subscribe to Plume, I'm just about to tell you. Listen up. Plume, again, that's P-L-U-M-E, is offering two years of membership to my listeners here on Technology Revolution, the future of now, for 50% off because they know this is a difficult time for a lot of people, but their service is great. So instead of paying $99 a year, you'll pay just $49 a year for two years. And if you do the math, that comes out to $98. Okay, go to plume.com slash techrevolution and the special discount will be applied automatically at checkout. Let me spell that, P-L-U-M-E dot com slash, and then the shorthand for my show, Tech Revolution, T-E-C-H-R-E-V-O-L-U-T-I-O-N. That's Plume. Thank you very much. Now let's get back to the show. It's time to start the first round of predictions, and after that I'm going to welcome another new sponsor. This is a busy day. So, Heather Fetterman, let's look at your prediction number one. Let's see if we can do one round of predictions from everybody. Panelists, please take about two minutes to explain what this means. This is really important to our topic. Heather's number one prediction, the 20th century notion that privacy is, quote, the right to be left alone, unquote, is over. Privacy is now about the right to control the information that is out there about you, including, and this is so important today, your movements. Heather, talk to me about this prediction, please. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about w- this idea that we don't always know what we mean when we say what is privacy because it's such an amorphous term and it doesn't always do a really great job of describing what it is that we really care about. And if we think, let's say, early 20th century, we have this idea that privacy is about this right to be let alone, that I have the right to hide, that I have the right to stay away that because it originates from this concept from um, from Brandeis, uh, where you basically would be keeping out photographers uh, from a private mm-hmm. event. But those days are over. We're we're literally alone. Ha- a huge majority of the population we're literally quarantined. So it's not that we're not alone, but we're still producing tons of data that's out there about us. And if we leave our homes, that's going to be tracked. So the idea that we want to be let alone, well, that's over. And a lot of people don't want to be let alone. They want connection. But what they may also want is the ability to control the information that's out there, the parties that have access to it, and how that information is being used. And that does apply specifically in the context of location information, because while on the one hand, we may want our location information to help stop something like a pandemic, on the other hand, we may not want it for uses like, as you pointed out in that 2018 article, if we mm-hmm. need to go to somewhere like Planned Parenthood for whatever sensitive reason. Yes. Thank you. Very, very important. I appreciate that. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's go to Joe Jerome's first prediction. Joe says companies should give consumers information and control over their own geolocation data, even though this likely solves none of the privacy or ethical issues. Joe, sounds controversial. Talk to me. <laughs> well, I apologize. <laughs> I feel like a little bit of my predictions are just sort of 
privacy truisms that I hear on all sorts That's of fine. privacy debates. And, and I actually think, I mean, Heather just sort of was talking about the need for control over this information. And I was looking back at, at a, a quick essay I wrote in 2015 where I was calling for more effective control over geolocation information. But I think you know, for the duration of this conversation, every time we say something like people should be able to control their information, you should like ding us with a bell because control doesn't actually work to meaningfully protect people's privacy, um, particularly mm-hmm. around geolocation information. Um, we idolize this because I think we, we want to have this idea that we are in, we are, you know, we are all rational human beings and we are all responsible enough to take a, our digital destiny into our own hands. Um, but privacy self-management is impossible. Um, when it comes to location information, we're, you know, we're given so much control that we are as, uh, I, I, I would encourage everyone to read a really excellent essay by Woodrow Hartzog. Um, and he, he actually mentioned this before Congress when he testified. We are given so much control over our information that we're choking on it. Um, mm. The reality is, when it comes to location information, we're given all these different opt-in consent requests, you know, clicking I agree to a whole bunch of stuff that we don't oh, understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can opt out of the other options that nobody, you know, can find these opt-out options because they're buried on in apps and web pages that nobody's ever heard of. And then there's all these other weird choices about how, what, when, where location data is being collected from us. And, and, a, and a really great example of this that hopefully we can discuss more about is that location information isn't just coming from, like, location settings on our phone. Um, They come from things like our Wi-Fi SSIDs, our network names. These things are constantly being mapped and tracked. And, uh, you know, in in 2016, the InMobi ad network, you know, it it got around our phone location controls by using Wi-Fi networks. Um, It was able to sort of ping and understand what Wi-Fi networks were attached to and then sort of work backwards to determine the where people's locations were. And you can opt out of this maybe, um, you know, one option is, and I'm sure no one, uh, none of your listeners have ever heard of this, if you add underscore opt out and underscore no map to your router network name, um, that gets it out of some of the tracking databases that exist. But who's ever heard of that? It's a pretty useless control. Um, and, I, and I think, so, you know, we constantly will sort of default to this well, if we just give people more control over their information, we'll have somehow solved the privacy problem. But there's just so many different ways that location information can be collected and derived um, that no one's ever actually going to understand what's going on. Thank you, Joe. And it reminds me of GDPR, which reared its head on May 25th a couple of years ago. And I still get inquiries from time to time asking me if a certain person was ever on one of my radio shows. I've interviewed, talked to panelists with <laughs> thousands of people in the past nine years, 200 live shows a year, three to four people or 18 people on a show. And and I have to go back and look and say, no, I never kept, no, I didn't keep anything, no. I, yes, I will. the right to be forgotten in Europe. Interesting. I don't think it, it ha- has any weight anymore. Thank you. Let me move on to Kanisa Ahmed's first prediction. This is a long one. Let me just read the first sentence and the last sentence, Kanisa, and then ask you to spend about two minutes explaining it. And then I'm going to welcome our second new advertiser after you. So here's Kanisa's first prediction, AI and ML and privacy, so artificial intelligence, machine learning. She says they will evolve to make mundane activities more efficient and safer through the use of fine-grained location and proximity awareness. Now, I'm skipping to the last part of your prediction. True privacy could become a luxury requiring special hardware or services available only to the affluent, akin to the concierge medicine COVID-19 world we live in. Woo! Kanisa, talk to me. That is a... Uh, prediction that's a bit packed, and, and I'll, I'll try to break it down um, a bit more. So artificial, in, artificial intelligence and machine learning are emerging technologies that help us ingest large amounts of data and uh, obtain new learnings and efficiency. So a really benign example to illustrate the potential for AI uh, for a larger society is um, agricultural. Um, much of the world's population depends on agriculture for their survival. For farmers to, to succeed, they monitor crops and produce quality. So with the help of AI, you know, farmers have a higher guarantee of growing uninfected crops. That's because, for example, they can use precise location data to treat crops, say, 
and 50 crops with only those that are infected. Now, uh, on, a, on a more personal level, it's safe to assume that the vast number of personal devices that we use every day, our phones, our laptops, other connected devices, will be location and proximity aware. Um, they are now and will continue to be, just as Joe is describing. And this is going to be overwhelming for consumers to manage. As mm-hmm. the normal operation of almost all hardware and software that we use is going to produce just oceans of digital information, and that's going to feed uh, these systems that are perpetually investing in, uh, ingesting information. And um, in doing so, optimizing their own performance, looking for ways to simplify our lives, making uh, our, our everyday lives more efficient and productive. Um, I think the utility of this is going to make privacy concerns seem quaint. And um, if I'm a patient, for example, if I know that providing location data to my healthcare provider can help me receive real-time information about my exposure to contagious illnesses, like we're just debating right now in COVID times, you know, you could see how I may readily give up my privacy with respect to my movement for that use. But I think taking it a step further, we're already seeing this uh, divide between the haves and the have not. We're seeing, um, you know, this health divide that will be multiplied on, on the digital, on the digital side as well. Um, and, and true privacy is going to be very difficult to attain unless you have needs. Thank you very much. Fascinating predictions. I'm going to take a moment out right now of the discussion and get ready, everyone, for prediction number two. And I'd like to welcome a second new sponsor. It's ExpressVPN. Hey, being stuck at home these days, you probably don't think much about Internet privacy on your own home network. Hmm. If you believe you can just fire up incognito mode on your browser and no one can see what you're doing wrong. Even in incognito mode, your online activity can still be traced. Aha! Even if you clear your browsing history, your internet service provider, known fondly as your ISP, can still see every single website you have ever visited. That's why when I'm at home, and we all are now, I never go online without using ExpressVPN. Let me tell you more about it. ExpressVPN, make sure your ISP cannot see what sites you visit. Instead, your internet connection is rerouted through ExpressVPN secure servers. Each ExpressVPN server has an IP address, get this, that's shared among thousands of users. That means everything you do is anonymized. That's important and cannot be traced back to you. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your data with best-in-class encryption so your information is always protected. Use the Internet with confidence from your computer, your tablet, your smartphone. ExpressVPN has you covered on every device. Tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the fastest and most trusted VPN on the market. It's rated number one, get this, by CNET, by Wired, by The Verge, and other marketing services. So here's what I have to tell you. Protect your online activity today, right now, with the VPN I trust to secure my privacy. I have a special link for our listeners. Here we go, expressvpn.com slash techrev, and you get three extra months free if you subscribe to a one-year package. Let me spell that for you, express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com, put in the slash, and then techrev, that's code for my show, T-E-C-H-R-E-V, expressvpn.com slash techrev to learn more. There you go. And now we're back to my three special panelists. We have Heather Fetterman at Big ID. We have Joe Jerome at Common Sense Media. And we have Kenisa Ahmed at Alita Privacy. Let's go to prediction number two. We still have plenty of time here. So, Heather, I'm looking at prediction number two. You say, right now you still have a choice as to whether you want to take a smartphone with you when you travel. Oh, Heather, if only we could be traveling. We are not far from a world in which people will be chipped, in quotes, with technologies that can track someone's location. Heather, where are we going with this? Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of more longer-term predictions. And I know that we can't necessarily travel right now, but even if I I want to go outside and walk the dog... Well, I'm able to do that here where I'm at, but I've heard of other places where the police won't even let you outside to walk your dog. And right now that's because they might be able to see you. But what happens when you're actually chipped, when your movements become 
tra- tracked wherever you go. It doesn't matter what sort of device you have on you. And we're starting to see this come up. There's a, a company, I think, in Wisconsin that uses a chipping technology to enter and exit the building, also somewhere in Europe where they're doing this. So right now that's just for authentication to get in and out of the building. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to enter a time where we'll start chipping ourselves, we'll, we'll start chipping our children, our, our dogs, and that way we can know where everyone is at what time. And it comes back to that question of, okay, well, we're, we're using this information. We no longer have that choice, but who is controlling that information about us that's out there? Thank you, Heather. Very interesting. Chip, chip, chop, chop. I, I don't know about all that. I don't have a dog. I don't walk a lot. I drive. Let's see where it goes in my car. Joe Jerome, prediction number two. Users think location settings on their phone are a simple on-off switch without realizing the myriad ways apps and devices collect and infer location data. Joe, please turn this into a prediction. Um, maybe users will know that locations <laughs> on their phone are a simple on-off switch. Joe, take me forward with this, please. Uh, I, I guess I guess I would say that um, sort of to piggyback on, on Heather's doom and gloom scenarios, that even if people think they're not sharing their location information, that, well, the prediction is there's going to be no way to avoid it. Um, you know, I think we've trained folks into thinking that it's pretty easy to hide or uh, turn off their location settings. Um, but the reality is that the number of different technologies that can be used to infer this um, are, are duplicating and, and replicating rapidly. You know, in my last prediction, I was ranting and raving about Wi-Fi networks and how useful they can be to derive location information. Um, but, you know, in addition to just sort of a location setting on-off switch on your phone, um, Phones are constantly giving information, um, location information just to function. So cell towers have uh, der- um, collect location information, GPS networks. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about Bluetooth networks, but if you have Bluetooth on, boom, um, you're giving away information about where you are. That's, frankly, um, how a lot of the, the Google and Apple contact tracing is going to work. If you have Bluetooth enabled, um, it's going to be able to sort of ping off devices. And then what's, you know, what I think is really hard for folks to grasp and really hard for me even to understand is, is how all of this stuff, all of these different location signals are being combined to make the information more and more accurate. Um, you know, location information can be derived from microphones. Um, with the proper setup, magnetometers in our phones can be used to help figure out where we are inside locations. Uh, so there's just huge streams of information that are giving away where we are and what we're doing at any given time. Um, and I think sometimes we try to we try to disguise this by saying it's pretty easy to just turn off your phone or not take your phone with you. But, you know, as, as Heather's pointing out, in a universe where everyone's chipped or they're carrying around any number of different smart devices and other people are, connected, are, are carrying around other devices, um, it's going to be very hard for an individual person to stay anonymous or obscure out in the real world. Thank you very much, Joe. Kanisa, I'm looking at prediction number two, and I'm just going to preface it before I read it, Kanisa Ahmed, is uh, this reminds me of, of the premise, the plot for so many procedural crime shows, NCIS, CSI, now The Rookie. We uh, Let me just read the prediction. It'll make sense. You say law enforcement, location data will be so ubiquitous that the few that go out of their way to turn it off, as we were just talking about with Joe, will be presumed to be hiding something, which will in turn draw scrutiny. Location awareness will be indicia or indicative of suspicious behavior used by law enforcement to target individuals. So, Kenisa, does this go back to the old, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't? Kenisa, I love this one. Talk to me. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit dark, I guess, and it kind of maybe shows my... my <laughs> a window into to how I view things. But, um, you know, traditionally the excess of, of location data is seen as something that's really beneficial for law enforcement. It helps track bad actors and criminal suspects. It's, it's a really rich data set um, integral to, to building any any case. Um, and because privacy laws hasn't, haven't kept up with um, mm-hmm. advances in technology, law enforcement have, have long claimed authority to access this information from cell phone companies without warrants, although that's um, slowly changing. Um, but in the future, as we've kind of been predicting, describing um, current, the future state, location data is going to be 
uh, ubiquitous. It's going to be used in, um, in, across all devices, but then, um, um, of course, in, in ways that we are, again, hard to, to predict. And I think that predictive policing are going to look for these outliers, people that are trying to go off the grid, people that are trying to, to, to uh, limit the use of location um, technologies. And that's going to increase the need for further obfuscation, additional noise, but it's going to be become uh, an, a vector that uh, law enforcement actually seek as a, a way to identify um, suspicious behavior. Um, and it's funny how that, that, that's going to flip. And there are a lot of different, I think, other um, technologies that I think we're actually along that way right now, but I think we'll see more of that in the future. Thank you very much. I think we have time for prediction number three. As a matter of fact, we have plenty of time. Heather Fetterman, I'm back to you. Uh, let's see. This is interesting. You say more context will be needed around the purpose of using location data. I think we've established that. Some people think we have that purpose now. And now you say some people want location data for when they're driving, uh-huh, called GPS, mm-hmm. or to find their phone, their smartphone, when it's lost, but not for when they're going to do something of a more sensitive nature. Consumers will demand an easy way to turn off or on the ability to trace their movements. Well, they're going to demand it. Are they going to get it? Heather, what's your prediction on that part? Yeah, you know, now that I'm thinking about Kinesa's point, I think she she's right, is that location data will become so ubiquitous that even though we may demand the ability to turn it off and on, I don't know if we'll get the right to that ability. And maybe that's why context will become more important. I experienced this recently when I actually lost my iPhone in the house, and I found it thanks to the Find My iPhone feature. So in that instance, I was okay with the location being enabled on my phone, but then what mm-hmm. about another instance where I might be going to for a doctor's visit and I might not want someone to know about that? If I turn off my phone in that instance, is that going to be something that might signal law enforcement that I'm doing something kind of sketchy? So I, I really does, I do think it's a mixture of that, unfortunately, Kanisa, I think, is right, that it will become ubiquitous. So that's why the usage of that location information, if we can, if we at least have the opportunity to set guardrails around it, will become really important. Thank you very much, Joe Jerome. Prediction number three, it's not a prediction, but I'm going to turn it into one, Joe. You know I am. You say location data is highly valuable, but often inaccurate or buy it. And I'm going to flip that and say location data we know is highly valuable, but will remain often inaccurate and biased. Joe, how did I do? Oh, no, I actually, I like it. That's that's a really good prediction. Um, and I think it reflects <laughs> sort of the technical limitations of what we're facing here. Um, in a prior life, I, I did some work on um, policy and procedures around wireless E911 location data. Um, mm. As an, This is basically when you're calling 911 from a mobile phone, can we quickly derive where you are to send sort of first responders? Yep. And you have a, you have a as, a, as a practical matter, a real challenge of the fact that Oftentimes, you know, we have issues determining whether a device is, say, on the first floor of a building or the fourth floor of a building. Um, And I think this raises really big issues and challenges with the sorts of contact tracing efforts that are being discussed right now. Um, You also have to sort of realize that all of this is, look, I think we all are sort of assuming that there's going to be ubiquitous data collection and technology in everybody's hands. But a lot of this will depend on access to technology and, and, and where you're located. Um, you know, I, I always think it's worth highlighting the, the sort of biased results we found with um, the Boston Street Bump app. Um, this was an application that um, the city of Boston rolled out to try and address where potholes were located in the city. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, people downloaded this application, and whenever uh, you know a car went over a pothole, it would be recorded and sent to the city. Well, it, you know, A, assumed that everyone had smartphones. It assumed people would download the application. Um, and as a result, it was severely underserving vulnerable and minority communities in Boston because these people either had uh, not smartphones, they either didn't have a car, they were using public transportation. And so you have to be always aware of these inaccurate and biased issues. And then the other real issue that we have to realize is that location data doesn't, I mean, 
so many of the, the use cases that are unrelated to law enforcement, which I think are, is worth a, an entirely separate conversation, or I'll defer mm-hmm. to Kinesa. Um, so many of these use cases are how is location information going to be used to sort of deliver us ads and be used to market products to us. But location data doesn't have to be super accurate to be valuable to marketers. It doesn't have to know that you're, you know, standing immediately in line in the Starbucks. It needs to just know you're near the Starbucks to send you the mm-hmm. ad. Um, and I think that actually means that, I hate to say as a privacy advocate, where maybe the expression is have our cake and eat it too, but it, it means that simultaneously location data can be very accurate, but oftentimes it's not as accurate as we want it to be. Um, and I think that certainly has ramifications in criminal contexts where police sweep up whole hosts of location information and have, you know, inadvertently accused people of, of crimes just because the data was a little bit inaccurate. Sure. And we see crime shows, Joe, where they say, oh, uh, we can tell that they passed a certain toll, right? Their car passed a certain toll, the tag on that plate, right? And and we know that they couldn't have been at the crime scene in Jersey City if they were in, in uh, Utah going through toll bridge number 92. What do you think, Joe? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I think there's there's some truth to that. But when you see it on TV, it's much, uh, I mean, it's almost easier than what really happens. And, and too often, I think that you know, the, the plots and dramas of a, of a 40 minute TV <laughs> drama doesn't let you get into the fact of when the technology goes wrong or goes bad. Exactly. And if, Kenisa, before I get to your prediction number three, I just found an article uh, from CNN Business dated June 18, 2018, entitled, or titled, iPhones will share your exact location with 911. And the, the premise for the article was, your smartphone knows your location well enough to send a car to where you're standing in a busy city. We know that ride sharing and we know that Uber. Uh, map a morning run through the woods or navigate inside an airport. But if you call 911 from that same mobile phone, emergency responders will only have a vague sense of where to send an ambulance, fire truck, or police car. And then it scrolls down to of the 240 million calls, remember this is 2018, 240 million calls made to 911 each year, more than 80% are from mobile devices. Apple at this time was working with a startup called Rapid SOS, which specializes in sharing a cell phone's location information to the major programs used by the 6,300 emergency response departments across the U.S. So that was something they were working on. Thank you, Joe. Interesting information. Kanisa, I'm looking at number three. This is an interesting prediction. You say centralized contact tracing. Ooh, you predict we'll move closer towards centralized contact tracing, resulting in, wait for it, everyone, government abuse of its increased surveillance <laughs> powers. How far off is this, Kanisa? Should we turn off our phones right after the show? Right. Well, well, we're we're facing down these issues right now, and um, and Bonnie, you spoke to this at the beginning of the show. Just to give a quick recap, um, mm-hmm. just a few days ago, Apple and Google announced a system for tracking the spread of the coronavirus. So it allows users to voluntarily share data through Bluetooth transmissions and improve apps. Um, and you know, the apps will send information out over Bluetooth using an anonymous key, um, and these keys are cycled uh, every 15 minutes or so. I'm skipping over a lot of technical detail just to give a quick summary. Importantly, though, there's no central master list of which phones have matched. Um, That's because the phones themselves are performing these calculations, and and the purpose of this is to to help protect privacy. Now, there's a a big divide between... uh, the approach that certain countries are are pushing to tracking um, the uh, spread of coronavirus um, as certain companies like countries like Germany, France, along with Singapore, UK, um, pushing for a more centralized approach uh, where the key matches would be done on a government-controlled server. So that means that government would have access to this entire graph of of, um, positive matches, allowing the um, government to, for example, send police to every infected person that an individual has been in contact with to enforce isolation. Um, So very effective, but also creates uh, wildly greater risks for abuse. Now, the the Apple-Google approach is decentralized um, and... It's meaning that, you know, the government does not have access to this kind of central database. And so I think I'd argue that the centralized approach is very effective, 
um, that creates greater risk for abuse. Decentralized, arguably less effective for a whole host of reasons, perhaps maybe more privacy protective, but also limits government power. So I predict that we're going to move to a more centralized model outside of the U.S., and we're going to say, say, uh, face significant difficulty in keeping a more uh, centralized model at bay. Um, and and I, I also predict that we, we may see abuse of this new Bluetooth uh, system technology, which is, which is very new and, um, and is being discussed by uh, experts right now about the ramifications. Thank you very much, Kanisa. We're just about out of time. I want to remind my listeners of my two brand new advertisers. Let me give you those call to actions again, and then I'll say thank you to my panelists. Here's how easy it is for you to subscribe to Plume. I talked about that around 20 after in the show. Plume is offering two years of membership to my listeners for 50% off, actually minus a dollar. So instead of paying 99 a year, you pay 49 a year for two years because Plume understands this is a difficult time financially for many of our listeners. Go to plume.com slash techrevolution. Evolution, and the special discount will be applied at checkout. That's P L U M E dot com slash tech revolution, T E C H R E V O L U T I O N. And the second call to action protect your online activity today with the VPN we can trust with our privacy. Visit my special link at expressvpn.com slash techrev and get three extra months free when you subscribe to a one year package. That's E X P R E S S V P N dot com slash techrev t e c h r e v expressvpn.com slash techrev to learn more thank you heather fetterman you brought me to a well yourself included three extraordinarily smart experts on the topic of the future of location data we were able to cover three of your four predictions each heather and joe and kanisa would you like to come back and, and do a part two in a couple of weeks with me and we can cover more what do you think Interested? Anytime. We'll, we'll definitely be able to see the contact sure. tracing after. Good. And down. Joe, you'll, you'll form your statements in the form of predictions next time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Heather, you're my champion today. Thank you for putting this together. Ryan Treasure, my co-producer. Thank you. Aaron Keller, my engineer extraordinaire with nerves of steel. He's old before his time because he has to put up with all of these interesting live shows. I want to thank our listeners for tuning in to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Remember, people tell you the future is already here. They're wrong. That was yesterday's future. The future of now didn't happen yet. We're all an important part of it. I send love and good wishes to everyone around the world and our listening audience and all of the people important to each of you. Be well, be safe, don't jump the gun and get back into normal activities too soon. We need to keep distancing and keep doing what we're doing to drive the curve down. Bonnie D. Graham signing off. Everyone have a great day and be safe. Thank you again. Heather Fetterman at Big ID, Joe Jerome at Common Sense Media, and Kanisa Ahmad at Ahmed at Alida. Everybody, have a good one. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Technology Revolution, the future of now. Mark your calendar to join host Bonnie D. Graham every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel to hear how technology is impacting your future now.